So, so last Wednesday night, it was a, a bit of a chaos, controlled chaos, next door into the, in the gymnasium as the young men and women under 70, 75, somewhere in there, I don't remember how old, ate more sugared cereal than you can imagine. I'm not kidding you. It was crazy. Anyway, now I'm totally convinced that the favorite of all of them was sugar frosted flakes. I, I don't know, that's my guess, but that was my favorite anyway. It was fun watching and, and seeing everybody have a lot of fun together. And when it comes to guessing how many pieces of cereal are in a bottle, there are two young men that, that need to give us all a lesson. You want to raise your hands if you won that contest? Liam and Paxton, I'll tell you what, you don't want to mess with those two because they are going to get you. They are going to get you. So anyway... Why don't you guys go ahead and stand up with me. Let's pray. And hopefully the sugar has worn off by now. Hopefully. Father, thank you for these young men and women. What an incredible joy they are. An incredible gift. We pray your blessing on their time together with their teachers and their volunteers today. That you would just help them as we prayed earlier. Understand who you are and how you challenge us and how you guide us through each and every day of our life. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you all in a little while, okay? Earlier this week, I put out a prayer request for my great niece. Uh, about a year and a half, little, little over a year ago, many of you were joining with us to pray for my, my niece, Annie, and her baby that was born way early, three, couple, two or three months early. And uh, Stevie was in the NICU for quite a while. And then she finally got out and has been doing really good. But she ended up in the hospital last week with RSV. And, and, and though she's doing great, she is behind physically. She just doesn't have the reserve to deal with some of these things. And so she ended up in the hospital. And then they had to give her oxygen and then more oxygen. And they ended up putting her in the pediatric ICU for about three days. But I, I wanted to give you an update and thank you on behalf of my sister, my niece, and little Stevie, thank you for your prayers because uh, the last text I got just a few minutes ago was that she's sitting up a bed, she's got a cough, but she's doing well, and uh, they're just waiting for the doctor to say she can go home. So praise God for that. We're so grateful, and my sister wanted me to thank you all for your prayers. We have been looking at the first letter that Peter wrote to believers that were scattered about Asia, experiencing trials and persecutions because of their faith in Jesus. This letter was written and it was carried by messengers who would travel to different locations where believers were known to be and share Peter's words of love and encouragement in spite of those persecutions. And, and I thought it might be helpful to give you a little background on where these messengers were traveling to to find these believers. And so we're going to go on a little trip this morning, okay? As you can see here, that's kind of, and I, I, maybe hopefully you can see it. And if I can remember how to, there we go. Here's, here's Jerusalem. Is it working? No, that's not working. Oh, there it is. Here's Jerusalem right here. And then where we're going to start out this morning is right here, just up north at Antioch. This is Syrian Antioch. It's very close to what we know as Syria today. And, and, and it's an overview, and it gives us kind of a scope, the whole thing does, of where Paul went on his missionary journeys. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, obviously, into Asia, then into Europe, which would be Greece and Italy. He, the, the guy got around, okay? Which was phenomenal when you consider it was either by sailing or on foot mostly on foot because Paul did not like boats. We know that much of the recorded old history of the Old and New Testament gives us Jerusalem as an important place. I mean, just huge. Um, but about 15 to 20 years before Peter wrote this letter, Paul had traveled on three different mission journeys referred to as his mission trips. And the first one started, I showed you where Syrian Antio Antioch is. And it was here that 
that Peter addresses the letter. Okay, I forgot that I got all fancy in here and put all these animations on the slide. That's what I wanted. Technology. Don't, don't let me loose with it, okay? Okay. It might be helpful to kind of get a background. We're not going to look at all the places where there are Christians in Asia, but each week I thought it might be good to give a better feel for where Peter's writing to. And so there was a church here in Syrian Antioch. And as you can see, on the face of a building, a, a mountain, they've, 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 they've fixed it up from what it was, but it was a cave. And that was because of some of the ongoing persecution, the increasing persecution Christians had been receiving. So they were careful about drawing too much attention to themselves in their gatherings. So if you visit Syrian Antioch today, you can go visit where one of the caves that they believe Christians met and had church together where it was. And, 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 and it would have been something like this where Paul and Barnabas worshiped with the believers in Antioch. They were respected leaders and teachers in that church. You, you walk through the entrance now and you come to a large covered area, but it's still a cave. They've dressed it up a bit, but it's still a cave inside of an underneath rock lodge outside of the city. And then you come up to the altar area where they would lead the service and there were areas that people would sit on the floor as they, as they worshiped. And you can go in there and you can get a feel for what the believers were going through at that time. And it was this group of believers in Syrian Antioch that encouraged and supported Paul and Barnabas to go on these missionary journeys. And so kind of exciting stuff. They sailed to and they stopped and they shared on the island of Cyprus. You can see it down there. Then after they were there for a time, they worked their way up to the mainland. There were Pamphylia and Lydia, Lycia is. And then they worked their way to another Antioch, Pisidian Antioch. Pisidian Antioch is in a significant stop in their journey in the book of Acts because it was there that we find Paul's first recorded sermon. And when Debbie and I visited this, this ancient city, the first thing that you noticed when you came into town was this stone road that led into the city. And it was a significant road. And as our group walked down this road, you could see the remains of small buildings on both sides of the main road, which would have been where the marketplaces were. People would have fruit stands. They would be selling vegetables. They would be selling their iron goods, their silver goods. Anything and everything you could want, that's where the marketplace was. It was their mall, okay? Yeah, they didn't have Amazon back then, so, you know. <laughs> it was kind of like Overland Avenue. Businesses on both sides of the street. I commented to our group later as we were, as we were walking down that road, it makes it all seem more real. And... and our group leader grabbed me by the, the left arm. He goes, come with me. He goes, walk with me. And so we walked side by side, and we stepped on each step all the way across to the left. He's like, okay, go forward to the next row of stones. We walked all the way across to the right. We went forward. We walked all the way across the rocks to the left again. He goes, now, without a doubt, you have stepped on the same stones that Paul and Barnabas walked on. And I'm kind of like, yeah. It was like, okay. It just got real. It made me jump. I, I realized that you talk about making the pages of the Bible jump out at you. And, and there's so much more I could show and share, but here's the point. Peter is writing to real people in real places. This isn't just a bunch of made up words, mumbo jumbo, trying to convince somebody or to deceive them or trick them. He was writing to real people with names and faces that lived in certain places, just like you and me. 
The power and the influence of Rome was great. And the fingers of Judaism were creeping out and, and also were significant. Followers of Jesus then and, and, and followers of Jesus now are going to be challenged. We're going to be accused. We're going to be dismissed. We're going to be mocked. We're going to be persecuted because people either don't want to accept that there's a God or they don't want to surrender control of their lives to anybody but themselves, especially to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So when they're threatened, they lash out. They attack. It was true then and it's true now. That's why Peter's words are so vital for us here today in 2024, just as much as the believers in AD 64 to 68 needed them. Okay? Just a little bit of background. Last week, Peter used two terms and he used them very similarly, and yet they represent two different things. Salvation, which is forgiveness and adoption as a child of God, and inheritance, the promise of eternity in heaven. Peter likened them to as two strands of a rope bound together that we hold on to for our living hope, all made possible by the resurrection of Jesus. And we closed last week with Peter's reminder, you, live, you love him even though you don't see him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious inexpressible joy. The reward for trust in him will be the salvation of your souls. Today we see Peter going forward and explaining a little bit more of what he meant. He starts out by referring back to the prophets of old, Isaiah and others who wrote and spoke about the coming Messiah. In verse 10, he starts, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. Once again, Peter emphasizes the hope of salvation. He highlights the greatness of what Christ did by observing that even the ancient prophets and even the angels long to hear about this salvation, this plan of God, which Peter says, you now know. And I'm reminding you of. The picture he paints here of the prophets and the men and women of the Old Testament looking forward and the want to see how God's going to unfold the promises of the Messiah and the prophecies he's given. I think that's a powerful picture. We understand nobody likes to wait. And these people have been waiting. The promise had been given. They've been told they have an inheritance through God, but, but they hadn't received it yet. And, and sometimes the anticipation when we're waiting for something can drive us crazy. Maybe that new baby that's about to come. Or, or maybe it's that new house that's about to be finished. Maybe it's the end of our schooling and receiving a certificate of completion or a diploma. Those are all big things. But when it comes to the things of God, written about and prophesied hundreds of years earlier, the coming Messiah, it takes all of the things of this world and notches it up a bunch. In Psalm 2, the psalmist wrote about a king that would come in glory and rule on his throne. They were waiting for that. They were excited about that. On the other hand, Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, the prophet wrote about the suffering servant who'd be beaten, despised, mocked, and scorned, and rejected. Guess which one the people wanted to see the most? Everybody loved and was waiting for the triumphant king of Psalm 2. But nobody could really understand the picture Isaiah Pony painted of Isaiah 53. They saw the triumph on the Mount of Olives where the, the Messiah would stand, but they also saw the blood on Mount Calvary on which the Messiah died. Peter says, how can it be, they wondered, that he will be was despised, rejected, and smitten, suffering, yet ruling and reigning? The two don't go together. It doesn't make sense. As the prophets, the men and women of the Old Testament looked at the scriptures and wondered what God up to, they missed there were two distinct comings of the Messiah.
They could see all of the the images that were painted in God's word, but they didn't recognize, and quite honestly, let's be fair, Peter and the others that walked with Jesus, they didn't see it either. They too expected Jesus to set up his throne on earth. That's a very obvious thing that we see from interactions that they had with Jesus. So when Jesus became the suffering servant of Isaiah, those disciples and those followers of Jesus, their world was turned upside down. But now, as Peter writes several years after that, to these believers that had scattered and going through some of the same persecutions Jesus faced, he writes to help them understand it's not just one or the other, it's both. And friends, we need to see that too. There's a window of time between the suffering servant who came and the conquering king that's still to come that we still wait for. We continue on in verse 12. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. He includes us in that address. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are, angels are eagerly uh, watching these things happen. That phrase translated eagerly watching in some translations looking into is the same phrase that was used to describe what Peter did when he got to the tomb where the stone had been rolled away. He eagerly looked in to see what was happening. So just as the disciples wondered about the meaning of the empty tomb, angels looked down and wonder, what's going on? What does this mean? I have to think they sometimes wonder, why in the world would God choose these people (laughs) to be his family? We spent the month of December looking at the first coming of Jesus in hindsight. 2020 vision, thankfully. And Peter's insight here is to remind us as amazing as the prophets were and and they were incredibly special. And even as holy and incredible as the angels are, they looked on just as we do at what God has done and is wondering what does it all mean? Consider the angels that brought the good news to Zechariah, to Mary, to Joseph. They didn't have the entire picture in their understanding just what God had revealed to them and asked them to share. That's one of the reasons Peter's words here are so encouraging to me. Because every every oracle of God, every word of God, the speakers of truth, those in the heavenly places, those like us, they don't see everything God's up to. He's so big, he's so overwhelmingly holy and just. We cannot know the things of God, completely and totally. Even when we feel like we're on our own or life is winning the battles we're facing, God's not surprised and he knows what he's doing. And the good news, the grace that Peter speaks of over and over again in this letter is that the salvation and inheritance that we have through Christ, that keeps us committed. That keeps us trusting our Father no matter what, no matter where. All of this, verses 1 to 12 of chapter 1 of this letter, is a reminder of what we believe. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah that saved us from our sin. That made it possible for us to be adopted by the King of Heaven, the Creator of all the earth. And we're promised an inheritance, eternity with God in heaven. Now in verse 13, Peter makes a pivot from what we believe to how our belief should guide our behavior. He says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Some of the, some of your translations might say that, use the phrase, gird your minds. Gird is not a term we frequently use today. The closest thing we can probably come to it is girdle. And even that term's not as common as it was 30 to 40 years ago. And and I'm wondering why most of the ladies in the room are thinking, thank goodness. When Peter wrote this letter, 
Most men and women were wearing long flowing robes all the way down to their feet. So if they needed to walk fast or be very active, they would wrap their clothes up, even tucking it into their belt. So when they walked fast or when they ran, they wouldn't get tripped up. It was interesting. If you see a representation of an armor, of a, of a soldier, usually they didn't have robes flowing to the ground. It was about to their kneecaps. Because they knew they needed to be ready to go at a moment's notice. So what Peter's encouraging here is prepare your minds for action with self-control. Fill your minds with the things of God so the things of this world do not mislead you or dis- misdirect you. In the modern terms, we might say Peter's thinking, roll up your sleeves and get to work. In light of what God's done for us, we need to get serious about getting down to work for him. Get the things in your life that might trip you up, might distract you, or cause you to stumble emotionally, spiritually, or even physically. Get them under control so you can follow God's plans and purposes to the best of your ability. Peter's saying, don't walk around with long robes or long faces. Pull up the mental garments that are tripping you up and change your way of thinking when it comes to your salvation. These people were sitting there under persecution, uh, isolated, discouraged, depressed. And he's saying, remember who you are and whose you are and where you're going. So you must live as obedient children. Don't slip back into the old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better back then. This is an interesting statement. There are some who argue that Peter's letter, this letter of 1 Peter, was written to Christians who at one time had a Jewish background and had spread from Jerusalem and Judea out into the rest of the world. Verse 14, and there were certainly some of those, but verse 14 indicates that's too small a a target because those who grew up with a Jewish background would not have been out living according to the world. Very, very, very few would have done that. So it seems to be that Peter's encouragement not to go back to the old ways would make sense only if he's writing to those who, who didn't have Peter's background of faith. He writes to encourage, don't go back. Don't go back. It was worthless. There was no hope. You came to faith. You came to life when you came to Christ. It's more likely he's writing to a mixture of both. And and he's like, do not go back to the myths and the false gods of Rome or the false gods of mythology and and, and stay true to the one true God. I love Peter's encouragement here as well as a simple reminder. The gift of grace that Jesus offered, the promised inheritance, the eternity with our heavenly father, That's what you need to remember. Live like a child of God. Don't slip back into those behaviors, those patterns of life from before your days with Jesus. You didn't know any better then, but now. I I love that that phrase in this, this translation. This is the new, I'm using the New Living Translation this morning. But now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. That's a reference to several passages in the book of Leviticus, as well as other passages throughout the word, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. Be holy because I am holy. Rather than jumping back into the things of this world, even in the face of persecution and resistance, don't give up being a child of God. Be holy because God is holy. As people whose sins are forgiven, you're different. You're set apart. That's what holy means. About 300 years after Peter wrote these words, a man by the name of Alexander would rise to power and become known as one of the greatest military minds and leaders the world's ever known. His influence and reign were the stuff of legends, and he never lost a battle. No one before or really ever since has been his equal. And I remember hearing a story about him. I don't know if it's true or not, but it makes it a powerful point that one of his soldiers had failed badly in his duty as a soldier. He showed cowardice in battle, and he was brought before Alexander and thrown at his feet. The man's story was shared, and Alexander asked him, what is your name? And the soldier said, my name is Alexander. And Alexander got furious. 
And he simply said, either change your behavior or change your name. (laughs) Peter writes to encourage us. You've been adopted by the king of kings. As a child, you wear his name. Be holy because I'm holy. You see, this is the key. What is our name? Christian, one in whom Christ lives. We're not saved. We're not forgiven by our holiness, by our righteousness. We're saved. We're set free from the bondage of sin because of the holiness of Jesus. Imitate your namesake. Be holy. Live faithfully as a child of the king. No more, no less. And remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Remember Peter started this book by writing to those who were, who were exiles, who were sojourners, who were strangers to this world. We're just passing through. We've got to know who we are, where we're from, and where we're going to. This world is not our home. Now keep the context in mind here. Peter's talking to a group of people going through some pretty difficult times. And in the midst of this difficulty, he said, you can either experience unspeakable joy or you can feel sorry for yourself. You, you can drift back into the ways of living that are outside of God's plans and purposes for his children. But if you do, if you return to your way of life before you surrender to Jesus, know the repercussions, know the consequences are going to be heartbreaking. Separation from God for eternity? There isn't anything worse I can think of. And believe me, in my short years here on this earth, I've seen a lot that's awful. Being separated from God for eternity is even worse. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from an em- the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. What price was paid? Peter gently reminds us in verse 19. It was the precious blood of Christ. The sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he's been revealed for your sake. Though through Christ, you have come to trust in God and you've placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Friends, if you're tempted to give up or to give in. If you're tempted to throw all of the hope and the promise of Jesus away, going back to the things of this world that are temporary pleasures and not eternal, remember the price that was paid. Consider the blood pulsing through the veins of Jesus as he hung nailed to the cross. See the thorns that were smashed into his skull. Listen to the crowd around him mocking him and cursing him. You see, that is what sin does. That's what it brings. And that's what you have to look forward to, the price that you'll pay if you reject or turn away from the grace, the forgiveness, and the life that Jesus gave you when he paid for you. When you start to forget or think faithfulness to the Savior is not worth it, Look to the cross. I mentioned last week, and I want to mention it again, we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus like the old song says and look full in his wonderful face so that the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Another song, one that we sang this morning, I think captures the heart of what Jesus, what Peter is talking about in today's passage. We sang that song, Holiness is what you long for. Faithfulness is what you long for. And holiness and faithfulness is not just what God longs for. It's what we need. In today's passage, those two characteristics, holiness and faithfulness, are woven all throughout this portion of Peter's letter, blending perfectly with what we witnessed in last week's text regarding our hope. There are a couple really clear instructions for children of God in what we've read today. First, 
Be hopeful. In verse 13, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. That's not always easy to do in a society and a culture that is imploding around us. It was then as well. It gets harder when we see many Christians caving in to the culture. When we see preachers standing on a stage of a church sharing things and, and encouragements that are contrary and in complete opposition to the word of God. It's confusing. We fail to understand when Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. He's not saying ignore, ignore what others is doing. We get defensive about that. But friends, he's not saying just live and let live. He's not saying you can do anything you want, anytime you want, and God isn't going to care. And yet that's what's being shared from, from a lot of pulpits today. So what do we do? If we take that stand, what do we do with the rest of God's word that so clearly states God's plans and purposes and guidelines for living as a child of God? Understand our eternal hope does not depend on the opinion of popular culture and opinion. It depends on Jesus, what he did the first time he came, and we eagerly wait for what he'll do when he comes a second time. Friends, there's not going to be any wishy-washy. I just didn't understand when Jesus comes as the conquering king of heaven. You're either for him or you're against him. Joshua, as he led the children of Israel out of the wilderness, made a very emphatic statement, similar to what Peter declares today. You can choose anything and everything you want. He said, choose this day who you will serve, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. The enemy of our souls knows that if he can get us to let down our guard, to relax our standards, we're vulnerable to a little attack here, another little attack there. And then there's a lot of things that can fill our minds to the place that we're distracted. Whether it's wealth, status, the news, sports, movies, position and power, beauty, family, friends, etc. The author of Hebrews reminds us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Because when we do all of these other things, they're not all bad. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, all these other things are going to find their proper place in our life. So be hopeful. And then Peter adds in verse 15, be holy. But he who called you is holy, also be holy in all your conduct. We need to be hopeful by being intentional in our minds and by not living inebriated lives. Some of your translations be, 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 be holy and be sober. More than that, Peter is reminding us that the standards of measurement for who we are and what we are is not the people and the culture around us. The standard is God. Since he is holy, we need to do everything we can to also be holy. And it's hard for us to wrap our hands around what holiness is, but essentially it means we need to live in such a way that we reflect who God is. In a world full of people claiming to have all the answers, all the insight into the supernatural, all the wisdom of this world, Peter simply reminds us, live in such a way at all times, in all places, all circumstances, so that anybody who sees you will clearly understand your life is not about you. It's all about God. I read yesterday about a father of a man who has had as great an influence on my life as a faithful follower of Jesus as anybody. One of my Bible college professors, his dad passed away in his 90s. But his words, my friend's words of tribute about his dad were so simple and to the point, he lived a full life and he served God well. Such a simple statement, yet in the simplicity of that statement, in the midst of that full life, was 45 years of service and ministry to the country of Japan. 
one of the most difficult and resistant fields for the Christian faith that there is. And even after retirement, they moved back to the States and he continued for the next 25 to 30 years to serve the church and the community that he lived in in many, many ways. In addition, he embraced technology. He was better than me. And through Skype, up until about a year ago, he was preaching on a weekly basis for a small body of believers in Japan that couldn't find a preacher. I'm like, oh my goodness. That's pretty incredible considering he left Japan back in 1999. Here's the thing. This man, though he's an amazing man of faith who impacted so many lives with his own life, when you consider the impact of his children and their ministries, I, I can't even begin to number, count, even come up with an idea of how many lives have been fixed and chance changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the simple man's faithfulness to God. He never had riches. He never had a ministry that was huge and thriving. Japan is impos almost impossible to do that. In the terms of measurement of this world, and what we look at and what we admire, he probably wouldn't get much of a second glance or a second notice. Yet he lived a lifetime sharing his hope with anybody and everybody to listen, one person at a time, and he did his best to be holy, to live a life that imitated the goodness and the heart of God. He passed away last Wednesday. I would have loved to be able to stand in a corner and watch and listen as that man received his inheritance as he walked from this life into the presence of his father. I just, the song says it well, I can only imagine, but I, I, I just think that'd be incredible. Peter's prayer Peter's plea in this letter to believers living in a difficult, resistant land is remember your hope. Imitate your Savior in the face of everything and anything. Remember Jesus. Be faithful and give your life to your living hope. Why? Because your inheritance it will be worth it. Would you pray with me, Father? I pray that Peter's insights and wisdom would inspire and encourage us in all of the hardships, the struggles, the trials that we're facing, as well as in the joys and the good things that are going on, Father. May we keep our eyes fixed on you. May we live lives remembering our salvation, that gift, our hope, our inheritance. And Father, may people see you in us. God, if there's somebody here today that has never accepted that gift of forgiveness and eternal life through your son, I pray that today... They will take the steps. They'll talk to somebody next to them. They'll grab me and that we can talk about and we can come to a place where they understand and they accept your gift, that they will let you adopt them into their family so they too have the gift, the hope, and the promise. God, until that day that you come again as that victorious, conquering hero, Father, keep us faithful. Give us your strength. And may the world see Jesus in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you need to talk about this, you need to know more about this, I want to visit with you. Jacob wants to visit with you. There's a ton of people in this room that want to share with you because we are convinced it's the best thing that ever happened to us. And we're looking forward to the day when we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, and we want you to hear the same words. God bless you. Have an amazing week. Keep praying for each other, for our world, for the peace of the Middle East, 
and that God would keep us faithful till he comes again. God bless.